morning from Acts 9. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. Her life overflowed with good works and compassionate acts on behalf of those in need. About that time, though, she became so ill that she died. After they washed her body, they laid her in an upstairs room. Since Lita was near Joppa, when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two people to Peter. They urged, please come right away. Peter went with him. Upon his arrival, he was taken to the upstairs room. All the, windows stood, all the widows stood beside him, crying as they showed the tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made when she was alive. Peter sent everyone out of the room, then knelt and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up. Then he called God's holy people, including the widows, and presented her alive to them. The news spread throughout Joppa, and many put faith, their faith in the Lord. This is the word of God. Well, good morning. I'm Cami Gaston, and um, as I told the folks at the last service, I'm related to Matt Gaston and other people. I've got a great mama up in the choir. I'm so grateful to be here today to be a part of celebrating women and women in faith and to offer this word to you. So if you would pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your ever-loving gift to us. And we ask your blessing this morning as we hear the word. We pray your presence be in our lives as we listen and ponder about what this means for us. And we pray that you would help us continue to be faithful. Use these words this morning as I offer them in the name of Christ. Amen. So there are some people who don't particularly want to live till they're 100 years old. And likely because, you know, it's, it's sometimes uh, difficult in those last years. And having a quality of life is important, right? Well, recently, there was a popular speaker and author whose name is Dan Butner, and he teamed up with National Geographic's to do a study of people across the world who lived to be 100 years old and had a certain wonderful quality of life. And as he teamed up with those particular folks, he, uh, they named these areas the Blue Zones. And he invited different experts from all over the world to take a look at these communities, these cities, and see what kind of things were going on that allowed these folks to live to 100 years and have a pretty good quality of life. And so there's a graph up here that I bet you all can't read. But I'm going to share a little bit about it so that you know what's on there. So one of the things that he shared, or some of the things that he shared, was that people um, who feel belonging have a longer life. People who have family first experience a longer life. People that are in the right tribe or have purpose or practice downshifting. And when I read that, there's other categories that are important too, like the bottom part right there is all about eating well, and the top yellow part is all about movement. Apparently, you don't have to go to the gym. You just need to stay active and moving. So all of those things put together, they saw, helped people live long and healthy lives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of these because as I read these, I, I, it occurred to me that these are things that we do in the church. And so I think if you're part of the church, then you're going to have an opportunity to live a wonderful, healthy life. So let me talk about one of the first ones in the blue, belonging. One of the things that he says, and the researchers all lifted up, was that of the 263 people that were centurions that they studied, almost all of them belonged to some faith-based community. 
And that would have been as experienced in their own culture. Researchers also found that if you attended church at least four times a month, you added four to 14 years of your, to your life. Now, Matt wanted me to tell you that again. <laughs> if you attend church four times, you guys got it going, right? Um, four to 14 years of your life. The second one was family first. And what he says about this and what was the most important part of this is that there are generational, there are benefits to living as generations together. And that those uh, children and adults who have this experience of integrated life together, and particularly older adults, end up having healthier children and healthier grandparents. And that they, they found that this interconnected purpose and, and the joy that was brought was just absolutely imperative for people to have a long and, and full life. So I was thinking about who we are. You know, it seems that when we gather to do VBS or Vacation Bible Camp, you see all the generations there. When we gather for moments on Sunday morning, you see the generations coming together in, in, in some of the Sunday school classes for the children and youth. It's a wonderful and exciting place to be in a, in a place where we have cross-generational experiences. So last week, I don't know if, if you all saw the, the pre-slideshow, uh, but last week was the fair, the fall fair. And apparently, there was a lot of fun to be had by very young and, and much older adults together. And that the joy of doing the cakewalk, the joy of, of just putting silly outfits on, all the things that people did together uh, added to the joy of their life. And that cross-generational experience was had here at the church. You know, I, I think about it. You know, what other community organizations have the kind of cross-generational experiences that we can have at a local church. We have the market on this, and we have something that we can offer the community. Right Tribe is one of those up there. It's all the three people. And it says there that if we encircle ourselves with friends that care about our health and well-being, we will continue to have the strength of living a good and full life. And so as I thought about it, today is United Women of Faith Sunday. And in this, this particular Sunday, as we celebrate United Women of Faith, I think about the fact that they have gathered and actually call themselves circles. And they've cared for one another in really significant ways. I'm aware that they provide transportation, they provide food. If someone gets sick, they make sure that they're taken care of. If somebody needs to be encouraged or has a birthday, they get care cards. There's so many ways that they nurture and are a part of, of being that healthy and whole kind of community that helps people have long, uh, healthy lives. Now, they're not the only ones that do this, of course. I mean, I've heard stories of people at the Yardbridge Shed and how much they care for one another. I'm aware that uh, there are youth groups that our youth group comes together, and if there's somebody that's hurting, they gather around and care for one another. I'm, I'm aware that, that we, as, as the, the congregation, have Sunday school classes and small groups and healing and counseling groups that that gather people around. This is the kind of right tribe they're talking about. It's the ones that will gather around you and hold on to you and, and help you be, have healthy whole life. The next one is on the green side. It's at the top and it's called purpose. So the research showed that if you have purpose and you know why you wake up in the morning, then you add seven years to your life. Most of us have a good idea of why we get up. You know, maybe it's to love and to be loved. Maybe it's just to, to take some time to think about 
what it means to care for another person. Our church says our purpose is this, to connect God and grace to self and where? Community. We know our purpose. We know that when we get up in the morning that we are going to connect to God, we're going to connect to the grace of God, and that we are going to be those who take that thing that we have inside of us and we want to give it to someone else. Purpose is important. And that having that beautiful optimistic perspective that says, yes, I want to be a part of life and embrace life. We know that God made us to shine God's light, to shine Jesus' light in this community and in the world. So let me talk about the other green one, which is downshifting. So one of the things that they noticed is that downshifting practices like meditation and prayer and reading and community conversation, all of these things quiet our souls. They take away our stress and they allow us to be connected to something greater than ourselves. They are all experiences that allow us to attend to our souls and then be able to go back out resiliently to be in the world and the things we need to do. So as I thought about those items, and I think we could probably talk about the other ones as well, but we probably could grow in some of those. I thought about the fact that all of these things are for the common good. We, as those who gather as a church, we care about the common good. When I read our scripture today, and when we heard the scripture read today, we were introduced to a woman whose Hebrew name is Tabitha. And the writer of Luke wants us to know that this particular person who served in such a beautiful way was somebody who cared for the poor, who did acts of charity, and really cared about the common good. And Luke spends a little bit of time as uh, kind of introducing her to us and so that we know who she is and why she might be important. And then we find out, as the story unfolds, that she's become ill, that she's died, and that her friends have circled around her and they have cared for her. And they washed her body and they immediately went to go find Peter. Now let me tell you about Peter. Peter had been in the region uh, all around Joppa, right next to the Mediterranean near Israel. And he, had, he was one of those persons who had obviously been sent by Jesus to build up the kingdom. And Peter had gone from place to place sharing about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's power. And he was healing people. And it was getting known that he was, had raised somebody from the dead. And so as she was laying there in state, she, he, he was called to be with her. So here comes Peter. And they, they, had, they had laid her there, and they had so much hope that they didn't put the burial salts on her. They only washed her body. And Peter comes, and he hears the, the, them share all the things that they wanted to share about her, how she was a seamstress that had beautiful clothes that she made for both uh, all the people in Joppa, that they were for the rich, for the poor, for anyone who had need. And so she, there, she, there he was with her, and as he listened to the women who were crying and telling all the stories, and I got to tell you, this part made me kind of nervous, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm a chaplain, and I've been in the hospitals, and when somebody's not well or, or ha on, has died, and when you need to bring them back to life, you need to be on it. <laughs> but I'll tell you in this scripture, it was important, I believe, to Luke that we hear the dedication of how much she belonged to them, how much she cared, and they cared for her. And so he says to, to the women, I need you to leave the room. And then he gets on his knees, and he starts to pray. 
And he prays for her in such a deep way and puts his hand out and calls her forth. And he says in the scripture, Tabitha kum. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you might have heard something similar to that before. Jesus, the Christ, says to the little girl that he's going to heal, Talitha kum. They sound so similar. But as we find in the scriptures, they put these kind of plays on words so that you know it's connected to something very spiritual. It's connect, and this one's connected to Christ's healing. And she's healed. And he take, she takes his hand, she opens her eyes, and she rises from the dead. And this is extremely impactful for all the people that are in and around Joppa as they hear this inspirational thing that happened to the people who have been following Christ. I think about the blue zones and how it is that a lot of that was going on in this particular scripture, that the women belonged to one another, that they were like family, that they cared for each other, they washed her body, that they had this sense of purpose that they knew Christ was going to bring life back to her, and that they, they were just deeply committed to her health and well-being. Those kinds of, of commitments to the body of Christ are powerful, powerful stories. When I think about how it is that each of them worked toward the common good, I'm, I am personally inspired. And I know that it will make the world a better place when we do things like that here. So just recently, I had my yearly physical, and I go to Baylor Scott & White. How many of you do a Baylor Scott & White? Well, they have everything electronic, and they let you know that you can go ahead electronically and do things before you show up. So I'm going through the questionnaire, and I'm looking through all the questions, and they asked some questions that surprised me. I didn't think they were medical questions. They were questions like, do I feel safe at home? I do. I know other people might not, but I do. Do you have food daily, weekly, monthly? Can you pay your bills so that you have air conditioning or heating? And they asked the, a question about transportation. Would you have transportation to get to your, your uh, pharmacy to get your, your, or to your appointments? And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of curious. I wonder, I wonder what they'll do. I, I wonder how they will respond to this. And then I got to thinking about it. You know, it seems that faith-based communities know the roots of why they exist, exist for the common good, that, that it, it's important to think about all those things when we think about the breadth of who we are in a faith-based community. And I know that I feel that way, those things get, happen in the church. And it took me to United Women of Faith. You know, United Women of Faith has been a long, a lot, of, they've been United Methodist Women, they've been church, uh, the Women's Society, they have done significant things over the centuries in order to help the welfare and common good of all of us. I remember the first time I saw that they had lobbied to get laws for children and, and child welfare. They've done a lot of things, and they've had their hands on the ground caring for people. So United Methodist, uh, or United Women of Faith, uh, has created safe places all over the world in order for women to have safety. They've done things, programs for housing. They've worked with and made blankets for children and babies. 
and clothing. They've done so many things that have made a big difference in the common good. And their influence and inspiration, I think, has set the tone for so many of us to live out our faith. So the United Methodist Women of, or I'm going to call you guys the wrong thing, United Women of Faith, can you all put that slide up, has this mission. They seek to, or we seek to connect and nurture women through Christian spiritual formation, leadership development, creative fellowship, and education so that they can inspire, influence, and impact local and global communities. I don't know about you, but from the time I was little, I was inspired by the work of the women of the church and the kind of ways that they got their hands dirty to care for everyone. It's pretty impressive. Church, I think we make an impact right here in Plano. I stood at the door last week and greeted folks as they came into the early service, and it, the box that was right next to me was for the school that needed some supplies and help for families. And there was nothing in that box when I stood there at a quarter to nine. When I came back and left the building at 11 o'clock, I could not believe how every box was full. You all respond to the needs of the community. And I found out from one of the persons who's running that program that we were going to be sponsoring originally one school. But other schools came to us and asked, and so now we're sponsoring three schools. And not just that, I found out that these schools are in such need and their families are in such need that they're deciding to go ahead and open food pantries at the local schools. The kind of way that we work for the common good is powerful. And I find that over and over again, we step up here at the church to be the people of God. So we have some things coming up. We have a mission event that can be engaged in that is for cross-generationally for everyone. And it's down, uh, I, I understand it's beachside. It should be fun. But it's an opportunity to be able to be in cross-generational uh, ministry. You can tutor at the, at the school for children. You can be a part of the plain old helpers or the service group, or you can teach our Sunday school kids and love youth. You can take time to adopt a grandparent because there's lots of grandparents around here that I know have a lot of love to give. And by the way, at the early service, that was very popular. So I just want you all to be prepared. It's our opportunity to grow in faith together. So Jesus commanded the little girl to stand up and live. And then Peter commanded and called Tabitha to stand up to live. We are all Tabithas in the world. And we have the opportunity to witness to the power of Christ through love. So I want to invite you and if you're game and able, I would like you to just stand up right now. Just stand up. And turn to your neighbor. <laughs> and I would like you to say, Christ has lifted you up. <laughs> and then turn to your other neighbor or the same neighbor. Okay, and say, stand up and live. Now, I want you to hear this. We could live to 100, and that'd be something special. But here's the good news. We, as faithful Christians, have everlasting life. So that means we have a long time to be those who stand up and live. And whether we're sitting 
in a wheelchair and standing tall or standing up, we have everything it is that we need to be Christ's people in the world. And so I invite you to stand up and live. In the name of Christ, amen.